I bring our next guest up, one quick question. One quick question before I bring our next guest. On your economic forecast of risk on, risk off, would, is it a market to buy into, to wait, or to sell out of? Um, well, I, I spoke about the number of downside risk. Omicron, what's going to happen with inflation, what's going to happen with the Fed and Central Bank, risk coming from China, geopolitical risk. So I would say you have to be more cautious. I would not be short on the market because there are still liquidity forces that are driving it higher, but I think that the risk of a correction is rising. So uh, until now, you could just be long in any asset they're doing well. Right now, you have to be much more careful and selective. Thank you. Let's talk about assets and move to the world of <laughs> cryptocurrency. Our next guest joining us on the stage is Antony uh, Terenchev, the co-founder of Nexo, uh, managing partner of a leading digit assets institution, formerly served as the chief in innovations officer of one of the major in European fintech groups. Sir, come and join us. I'm going to give you the opening gambit at the moment. Do you see crypto as a currency or an asset class? Cryptocurrencies as such are an asset class, and there are like more than 15,000 different uh, cryptocurrencies. Each of them vary. Bitcoin, the dominant one. Uh, I think the earlier narrative was that this is going to be a currency. It turned out it is not. It is closer to digital gold, gold 2.0, because of its inherent uh, characteristics, scarcity, fixed uh, amount, uh, the ease of transaction, the immutability of transactions. Uh, so it is closer to an asset like gold. Some of the other currencies, you know, we have stable coins, which are good for transactions on a daily basis packed one-to-one -to, -one to the dollar, so it really depends on the asset classes that we're, uh, the particular cryptocurrencies that we're talking about. Nuriel, what do you say it has? Well, I think that uh, calling cryptocurrencies currencies is a misnomer, because anybody who knows anything about uh, currencies and monetary theory knows that uh, none of the features of, unquote, these cryptocurrencies have any to do with a currency. I mean, for something to be, first of all, a currency has to be a unit of account. Things have to be priced in mm -hmm. that. So, you know, all the goods and services in the United States are priced uh, into dollars. In the Eurozone is priced in Euro, in Japan, Yen. Nothing, literally nothing is priced in Bitcoin, let alone Ethereum or anything else. But so it's not, it's not, first of all, a unit of account. Secondly, for something to be a currency has to be a scalable means of payment. With Bitcoin, you can do seven transactions per second. With the Visa network, you can do 50,000 transactions per second. Three, you have to be a stable store of value over goods and over wealth. Uh, you know, if the price of something moves 20%, is not stable relative to baskets of goods and services, so nobody can use it as a numerator for that stuff. And it's not even a stable store of value relative to wealth. Just during the last uh, four weeks, right. that the value of Bitcoin has okay. fallen 30%. Finally, if I can make a point, you need to have a single numerator in order to compare the relative price of two goods and services. But if I need a Pepsi coin to buy a Pepsi Cola, a Cola coin to buy Coca Cola, uh, then I cannot even compare the relative price of two goods and services. And you have a tokenization where pretty much every goods and service has All a right. different token. So none of the conditions and the features of money or currency is satisfied by any one of these cryptocurrencies. So calling them currencies is just a misnomer. They are not currencies. Right. So I think we'd probably all agree at that level. But what, what do you, Antonio, what do you see as being the value that they bring other than as a speculative investment? Well, as a speculative investment, it's also very important because I beg to differ to what uh, Dr. Rubini said about store of value. You take Bitcoin uh, and its track record in the past 13 years, it is the best performing asset of the decade. It is the best performing asset on any time scale 
uh, longer than one year. So you take the one year, the three year, the five year, Bitcoin outperforms, and this is for a reason. It is uh, of its intrinsic value, the characteristics it has in place, the monetary system, this f money printing frenzy that we find ourselves in, this uh, uncharted waters we're currently uh, in, and you know, Except, it's still except, early except, days. Except. It is early with respect, days. With and respect, hang on. Yeah. With respect, this I, I, and and, I, and this is not to deny that there are huge amounts of money going into it, but this monetary printing frenzy yep. of which you speak is that which is supporting the global economy and preventing vast amounts of destitution and poverty. Well, it Last is. Last I saw, Bitcoin wasn't doing that. It is. There, there are two things. There's the speculative element and then this infrastructure, the cultural movement of Bitcoin. Right. And Dr. Rubini talked about this being early days for Bitcoin and for crypto, and they are. But we already have a country uh, in the f uh, face of El Salvador which uses Bitcoin as a means of accounting. Bitcoin is another step in the evolution of accounting. We had the single entry system, bookkeeping, we had the double entry uh, uh, bookkeeping system, and now we have the triple entry uh, system, which is cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, which allow you know, debits and credits, but also the real-time uh, following of those assets on balance sheets and you know, okay. smart cards, contracts, even the movement of goods themselves. Do you agree there's a difference between cryptocurrency per se yeah. and blockchain? And that blockchain has a wider use within economic activity than crypto? Well, there is in principle a difference, but if you look at any type of uh, implementation of blockchain, because there is a lot of talk right now about <coughs> enterprise DLT or corporate blockchain. The reality is that every single example of these things, uh, the system, the DLT, is not public, is private, is not permissionless, is permissioned, is not based on a trustless verification of transactions, but is based on a bunch of authorized uh, validators are transacting. <laughs> it's not decentralized, but it's centralized. So they call it blockchain, but doesn't have any of the feature of the blockchain. It's supposed to be public, trustless, permissionless, and decentralized. To me, it's like a glorified the spreadsheet. You know, I use Google Docs. It's a permission system that allows me to share documents with other people. Nobody calls it a DLT, nobody calls it blockchain. So what they call blockchain is not blockchain. It's sexy to call it blockchain, but it is private, it's centralized, it's permissioned, and it's based on trusted validators. So what's blockchain about? Because the underlying technology is no, one of a shared uh, diversity. No, there are already shared the documents like Google Docs and others that are shared uh, permission documents that are not called DLT, they're not called blockchain. Blockchain is supposed to be something that is public, permissionless, trustless, right. and decentralized. Well, we're talking and about programmable money here, right? You can compare programmable, programmable money to a spreadsheet, even if it's Google Docs. So uh, it, it, it's different things that we're talking about. The technology underpinning cryptocurrencies, blockchain is there. It has shown its merits, and the genie is out of the bottle. The next round of financial innovation is going to leverage on that system for the simple reason that the people, the end user, the consumer is going to demand it. It takes a split second to do a transaction on the blockchain. It gets verified in a few minutes. You can send a million dollars from here to Australia in less than 10 minutes, depending on the blockchain and the cryptocurrency, very cost efficient. But why is that no, any when can, you can I say compare one that it takes, to, it, it let me finish, your, let, let me finish. No, I, I, no, I let you speak, you let me speak. Uh, when you go to your JP Morgan Chase or whatever, and you do your swift transaction, it takes five to eight working days for it to settle again at uh, the will <laughs> of the bank if it permits it and it costs you several hundred dollars to do precisely that so the technology people have seen it and that's why the world central banks are working on infrastructural products such as the digital uh, the cent central bank's digital uh, currencies I because they're implementing their technology and seeing the merits there the, the, the reason why it takes uh, two or three days to do international transaction 
when you do a wire transfer is because uh, banks have to do the appropriate MAL, anti-money laundering, and KYC, not your customer. So they have those compliance costs, and because of that, Technologically, a bank using SWIFT yeah, can literally do a transaction no, in, I, well, in two not. seconds. It's not as if definitely the blockchain not. technology is any better. I don't, I don't the point is that in blockchain, there is no MAL, there is no KYC, <coughs> there is no compliance cost, and there is a lot of shady activity. Uh, right. so because of that, it's very fast. So as Once I you have those compliance costs, you'll be in a situation which then you can compare oranges with oranges. So I do, right sure, now. the I number one choice I do. of hang money on, launderers hang on, is hang on. dollars. Stop. I, I stop. do, <coughs> I do more transatlantic transactions than most people because I have to pay bills in the UK and I pay bills in the US where I live. And the, when I started doing it, uh, what I'm getting a, a timeline here, but I'm uh, we, 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 plenty of time, plenty of time. Um, <clears throat> when I started doing it in the 1990s, 80, 1980s, it was three days. If I now do a transfer in the morning through JP Morgan, through to Ch uh, HSBC, it's there by lunchtime. Because, but the interesting point I'm saying, let's get to the principle here. Yeah. Let's get to the principle. The principle I want to return to KYC and AML. Though. That's what's the principle. Right. The principle is, sure, you know, maybe you'd agree that Know Your Customer has become too bureaucratic in traditional banks. So a bank I've been with for 35 years still wants to see my birth certificate. Yeah. But would you agree that there needs to be decent regulation of crypto and define decent regulation? Sure. There already is a huge interest out of, uh, from the regulators as to how to confine crypto within the rules. And that's good. That's what I personally am all about. That's what the company that I help run is all about. Having precise, concise, business-friendly rules within which we can operate. But, you know, this is like taking crypto and saying this is a special case and then you have the nice innocent banking industry which has never done any sort of money laundering or whatever the number one uh, uh, choice of money launderers and criminals is the US dollar and as long as we do not change the incentives for them you know every time a bank gets no, no, uh, think, gets caught with I'd, the pants hang down hang on they, so stick to crypto because no, the, the, but, but that is the, important the world, because we're important, singling out world, crypto as if it's something wrong and it's, no, it's not in no, every industry there are good why, actors and bad actors i'll tell you why because the traditional banking sector has paid billions in fines for it, money laundering. Exactly. And, and it pays 10% on the proceeds it got it from money up. laundering, then it keep on doing it. I, I, Do let you, me tell you see systemic risk in crypto? I see the potential for it to grow, to be systemically important. It's not there yet. It could go to zero, and there wouldn't have a major effect on the world economy. Uh, well, right now, the size of crypto assets at this formally is uh, 2.5 trillion. I'll remind you that during the global financial crisis, the stock of subprime mortgages was less than 2 trillion. And there was a huge amount of leverage in subprime and there is a huge amount of leverage in crypto. So we are getting closer to the point in which actually a shock to crypto assets may lead to a systemic effect because now it's not just retail investors or a bunch of whales there, but institutions are also entering right. into this business. And once you have, that's why you have a correction of 30% overnight, because right. there is so much leverage in this particular industry. I mean, some of those derivative exchanges were offering you 100 times uh, leverage to retail investors. That's criminal right. behavior. That's why BitMEX was indicted. Yeah. Well, the total market cap is much <clears throat> smaller because these are tokens that are held by the founders <clears throat> and they're in liquid, so it's nowhere near three trillion, but it's getting more important. Uh, you know, the corrections that you speak about of 20, 30 percent, they show you one thing and they show you that crypto is the only free market. We don't have lenders of last resort. We don't have the Federal Reserve 
put that comes in the market, you don't have the pledge protection team. What you said about 100x leverage, we don't need that. That's bad. That's for uh, uh, the, the detriment to the entire space. I've been very vocal about it. These are just giant casinos that allow people to lose their money really efficiently. We don't need that. But that doesn't mean that all crypto is better. We should be anywhere near thinking out lowering it because there are so many good things about it. Should, there, should central banks do? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a disagreement within central banks at the moment between you know, the rush to have CBDC versus those who say, we've already got it. When we do a transfer, it's done di digitally anyway. We just need to refine the process. Uh, uh, and, and also, by the way, no. the systemic issue of individuals being able to have accounts with the central bank. I mean, I would say that the tennis is going to be one in which, uh, step by step, most central banks are going to introduce a central bank digital currency. Uh, the first one to do so among the big ones is going to be the PBOC during the Winter Olympics. Uh, in Sweden, there will be a second one. The ECB is planning to do so. And then the Fed is going to realize that once you have a digital RMB that becomes <coughs> a potential alternative to US dollars, a global reserve currency, US has to do the same. There is no reason to have essentially coin and cash. Less and less people are using it. And right now, you have an inefficient system because in order to make transaction, the banks have access to the balance sheet of the Fed, but individuals and corporations and nonprofits do not so. Suppose they had a system in which every individual has access to the balance sheet of the central bank. You'll have a system in which payment transaction don't have to be done through credit cards, don't need to be done through ACH, they don't have to do through wire mm -hmm. transfers, don't right. have to do it through a check. They'll be instantaneous, they'll be free, they'll be riskless, there'll be full settlement and clearing, and therefore that's the direction we should be going. It's only a matter of time. Right. And once that happens, of course, crypto is going to disappear. There is not <laughs> currency. The problem is that also the <laughs> banks are going to be disintermediated because the deposit sure. system right now is having a function of payment system and money. We are. That's the biggest risk to commercial banks, we not to crypto. That is we not are out of time. I'm going to give you the choice. I'm going to give you the choice. I will give you one. You can either have a dollar, gold, euro, or a bitcoin, or a proportion thereof to it. Which will you take? I would take, first of all, the dollar, but I would also buy some uh, gold because I think that inflation is going to rise and gold historically has been a good hedge against inflation, while Bitcoin is not a good hedge against inflation. So uh, I think that calling it a digital dollar is a misnomer. Obviously, Bitcoin and gold. And if I ever need fiat currencies, I will just take out a loan. Not to toot our own horn, but that's what my company does. So you can take out the loan against your uh, assets. It, very good rates. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, an excellent debate, and one that is absolutely, it is not esoteric because it is happening around us at this moment. Thank you both.